Good evening, and, and welcome to our second uh, Peace Fellows public event. Uh, my name is James Traub. I'm a teacher here at NYU Abu Dhabi, and I'm very excited to see some of my current and former uh, students here. Uh, and uh, our guest this evening, who I'm, I'm very honored to say, is my friend David Malone, who is uh, one of the most uh, one of the most senior Canadian diplomats and a leading policy intellectual in the field of international relations. Uh, David is now the rector of UN University. UN University in Tokyo is the UN's think tank. Uh, before that, David was the president of the International Development Research Center in Canada. Before that, he was uh, Canada's High Commissioner in India. He was formerly uh, Canada's Deputy Perm Rep in the UN, and he was the head of a very important think tank uh, on UN issues in New York called the International Peace Academy. Uh, David has written really important books on a wide range of subjects, on Iraq, on Haiti, on UN Security Council decision making, most recently on uh, foreign policy in India, a book called Can the Elephant Dance? So David is someone who really is an important scholar in a wide range of fields, as well as having been and still being a senior diplomat. So we're very fortunate to have him here this evening. So David, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much for having me here. Uh, it's terrific. Uh, in Tokyo, it's beginning to be spring, but not as nice as it is here. And uh, I've been coming to NYU Abu Dhabi practically since the beginning, because very early on, there were a couple of policy conferences that were extremely exciting, bringing together people from all over the world. Uh, there wasn't a campus then. The next time I came, there was the temporary campus, which I thought was very handsome, uh, but I knew better was to come, and here we are. And uh, throughout, Al Bloom has been here uh, steering this extraordinary initiative, and I was delighted to meet Pam earlier today. Uh, and Fabio, you've also been a terrific ambassador for this university uh, in your work. And uh, both of you gave up a lot to come here. So you believed very strongly in this initiative. I've believed in it strongly too, because my former dean at the NYU Law School was John Sexton. And anybody who has worked with or for John Sexton knows that once he commits himself to a goal, uh, there is no relenting until it's achieved. It's one of the many things I admire about him. Uh, Jim, it's a very kind of you to host me here. I'm thrilled to be here uh, with you. Uh, Jim has written books on a variety of subjects. For the moment, he, he's totally engrossed in John Quincy Adams. But he wrote by far the best biography of Kofi Annan. And Kofi Annan was quite upset when the book came out because it wasn't unadulterated uh, praise. It was uh, an assessment of Kofi as Secretary General. Uh, interestingly, today, Kofi agrees with everybody else that it's the best book on Kofi Annan, including his own book on Kofi Annan. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, I have a bit to gallop through in the next 20 minutes, so I'm going to do it basically in point four. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Security Council since the end of the Cold War. And the end of the Cold War came at the UN before it came with the fall of the Berlin Wall because President Gorbachev, a new, young, dynamic, for a change, president of the Soviet Union, had figured out even before he became president that the Soviet Union couldn't afford the superpower confrontation. He was determined to settle it. And very early on, he started arguing in articles that appeared in the Soviet press, 
that uh, essentially the United States and the Soviet Union should agree that the Cold War uh, could end, and it could end through the intermediation of the UN, which could help resolve the conflicts those two powers had been fueling throughout the world. And at first, the West was very skeptical. It's interesting to look back to the editorials of the New York Times and other papers at that time who simply thought this was a propaganda ploy. It was not a propaganda ploy, as became rapidly clear. And as early as 1987, the Russians and the Americans, together with the three other permanent members of the Security Council, were working very closely to bring an end to a conflict very near here, the uh, murderous and largely pointless Iran-Iraq war, uh, which the UN hadn't done a very good job until then of resolving. But in 1987, uh, the permanent five members, who simply to remind you, are the United States, today the Russian Federation rather than the Soviet Union, France, Britain, and uh, China, um, were proposed a settlement outline to Iran and Iraq uh, um, through the Security Council in the summer of 1987. Both sides delusionally, as countries that are very exciting, excited usually are delusional also, believed this was extremely unwelcome because each side still thought it could win the war in spite of seven years of both countries losing the war. So they went on both losing the war for another year and at the cost of many tens of thousands of lives and then completely exhausted, they accepted the uh, proposal of the Security Council. It took very few UN observers to verify that the ceasefire was being respected by both sides. And within a year, uh, nobody could really remember the Iran-Iraq war. So thoroughly was it actually settled. And that was the beginning of the biggest change of the post-Cold War era which was that the uh, great powers discovered they could work with each other productively. And that, in effect, started ending the Cold War. So there are some basic changes that flow from that one, but that one is the most basic. Now, uh, smart people in the room, particularly smart students, would immediately say, but they don't agree on Syria. They don't agree on Libya. They don't agree on Ukraine, and they would be right about that. But on 90% of the Council's agenda, which are even more murderous conflicts, often in Africa and places like uh, the Congo, uh, the Council has no trouble agreeing. And on conflicts elsewhere, other than the three I mentioned, they can generally agree. Even on Syria, there have been areas of agreement, for example, on the removal of chemical weapons from Syria. And in a little known, uh, little noticed move uh, last summer, the Russian Federation shifted its position slightly uh, to join the other members of the Security Council in asserting that humanitarian access should be a right of any Syrian uh, citizen within the country, and by implication that uh, the government in Damascus should no longer have a veto over access to international assistance anywhere in the country, uh, which for the Russian Federation, I'm sure, required quite a bit of thought, quite a bit of argument within uh, the Moscow establishment, but they made that shift. So even where there appears to be deadlock, there is sometimes uh, movement, partly because um, confrontation and systematic confrontation actually works for nobody much over time. Um, but since the end of the Cold War, because the Security Council working with others, 
was able to resolve most of the uh, Cold War era conflicts in Indochina, in the Horn of Africa, in Southern Africa, and in Central America, a new generation of conflicts uh, grew up. And they were essentially internal conflicts, civil wars, they're sometimes called. Now, uh, they rarely remain strictly internal for long. They sometimes suck in neighboring countries. They sometimes spill over into neighboring countries. But their core is an internal argument, usually over the sharing of power and wealth within uh, the borders of a country. And these conflicts are not something the UN had much experience with. It had dealt with Cyprus, and it had dealt with the Congo, uh, not very convincingly in either case. But now, nearly its whole agenda was civil wars, and they proved much harder to resolve than conflicts between countries. Several reasons for this, but if you think about it, um, one is that uh, if rebels rise up against a central government, um, it's a dangerous strategy. If you think of history, history has not been kind to failed rebellions, failed insurgencies. Often the leadership is wiped out completely, and often the population suffers for generations as a result of the failure of the rebellion. So uh, rebels are remarkably reluctant to put down their arms, even uh, as the result of an international mediation. Secondly, um, if you think of the parties to a civil war, who are they? They're a government. And international mediators know where to find the government in the capital. They know who the government uh, people are, they're usually a very bad government. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a civil war. But at least we know who they are. The rebels are something else, because sometimes there is a single rebel force, but quite often there's a multiplicity of rebel actors vying with each other as well as against the government. And so for an international mediation, that's extremely difficult. Because if the rebels can't agree amongst themselves, how are you to have uh, a negotiation? And so uh, these wars have proved much more difficult for the UN, for the Security Council. And it's the first big difference in the nature of the Council's decisions. They address civil wars. The second uh, big difference in the nature of the Council's decisions is with the permanent five members, all of whom have a veto, all of whom can block any decision by the Council, with their new habit of cooperating more, if not perfectly, it has become possible for the Council to be more forceful in its decision making to impose sanctions more often, to authorize uh, naval blockades that, in effect, enforce the sanctions, and to authorize the use of force by UN peacekeepers, more often by uh, countries willing to implement the Security Council's decisions. And that is a very basic change, because throughout the Cold War period, the Council authorized sanctions only twice. It authorized clearly the use of force only once. And today, all of this is routine, so big shift. A uh, third shift, which resulted from the Council having a much more active agenda, doing much more in the post-Cold War era, is that the Security Council and the UN rapidly became overloaded with work. And they started looking around for who might help them with the work. And the organizations they found that uh, occasionally could help the UN were regional organizations. They weren't always formally regional organizations. NATO, for example, is a military alliance. It isn't formally a regional organization. 
but it is a regional actor. And so regional actors became important partners for the UN, including uh, on some of the crises arising out of the Arab Spring, the Arab League, for example, which had not had much to do with the Security Council earlier. Um, now, I'm going to talk about two other sets of changes and then perhaps sum up with um, a provocative conclusion. Um, the next set of uh, changes are in the motivations of the council. What is driving council decisions? Uh, one element of um, uh, what I'm about to say may surprise you, and it's the first motivation. The humanitarian imperative has become a very strong driver within the Security Council. Now, if you're a judgment, in a judgmental mood, you might say the United States isn't driven by humanitarian objectives, the Russian Federation isn't, China couldn't care less. You would be wrong, because in each of those capitals, there is a desire to see the UN whenever possible, whenever not in conflict with their own interests, uh, relieve humanitarian distress, particularly conflict-induced humanitarian distress, uh, when possible. And that is why the Russian Federation shifted its position last summer on uh, access to humanitarian assistance for the Syrian population within Syria's borders. Uh, and China, by and large, would much rather vote for humanitarian assistance than against it. And that is true of most countries. All of that is quite new. During the Cold War, humanitarian considerations never really came up in the Council. Humanitarian action was largely the province of the Red Cross system, uh, which isn't part of the UN and a few specialized agencies like the High Commissioner for Refugees, UNRWA for Palestinian Refugees, uh, UNICEF and the World Food Program, for example, were involved, but without any particular mandate from the Security Council. The second uh, driver, which is new, is a concern over terrorism and the spread of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and that is something all member states of the UN feel quite strongly about because virtually all of them fear terrorists. And all of them know enough to fear the, the spread of weapons of mass destruction, particularly to non-state actors whose intentions and motivations are often hard to know. Uh, so that has become um, a very strong driver. You might think it was a strong driver during the Cold War, but actually it rarely came up except rhetorically. Uh, and the uh, third uh, driver, um, but often more at a rhetorical level than in reality, is a defense of the sovereignty of states. Uh, the truth is that many of the Security Council's decisions on civil wars preempt the sovereignty of at least the country that is subject to the civil war. The Security Council will take decisions that are imposed on that government, and sometimes other actors. But in principle and in law, Sovereignty is the cornerstone. Sovereignty of states is the cornerstone of international relations. So we go on hearing a great deal about sovereignty. And so it often appears to be driving the Security Council. Institutionally, some things are new. And again, uh, one or other of them might surprise you. Uh, because I grew up in France as a teenager, I always have structures in three parts. <laughs> so this is a three-part structure with three points under every heading. That's how strongly our education influences us. 
So uh, the first one I'd mention, which many of you will take for granted, but which is strikingly new, was the creation by the Security Council of a new field of international endeavor, international criminal justice. We had had, after the Second World War, uh, the Nuremberg War Trials uh, and the Tokyo War Trials, which are less well known. But they weren't really international. They were trials organized by the victorious powers that published, punished the worst offenders uh, in the defeated capitals. Um, in, 19, uh, in the mid-1990s, the Council had, amongst other failures in a period of many initiatives, two that stood out even to the Council itself as horrendous. The first was that it stood by and took unwise decisions uh, during the genocide in Rwanda. It didn't react positively. It didn't react in a way such as to stop the genocide in Rwanda. Some of the UN peacekeepers who happened to be in Rwanda, notably the Ghanaian contingent, were extremely brave. After the Security Council had called for all UN peacekeepers to be withdrawn, the Ghanaians, which couldn't, who couldn't find a plane to take them back home, stayed and saved many lives by collecting targeted people in the stadium of Kigali and protecting that stadium. It's a story that's not enough told. Although General Dallaire, who is much celebrated for his bravery in Rwanda, always tries to remind his audiences that it was the Ghanaians who saved lives. Uh, but the Security Council did nothing. Uh, there were two countries that might have been expected to know a lot about Rwanda. One is the United States, which knows a great deal about many things, but uh, doesn't always organize its knowledge uh, very productively, which was, uh, we are told, uh, we were told subsequently, too busy worrying about Bosnia to worry about Rwanda, so they didn't. Uh, and the other country, probably much more deeply implicated in the events in Rwanda, was France. But France, uh, for one reason or another, officially didn't know a thing about what was going on in Rwanda and certainly had nothing to say in the Security Council about what might be going on in Rwanda. Uh, so that was a terrible failing, and I'm going to come back to it. There was another. Many of you will remember the Balkan Wars. And during the Balkan Wars, uh, the great powers were divided over strategy. The United States favored greater use of force against uh, Serbia, which it perceived as the guilty party. And the Europeans, who don't like the use of force so much, argued, no, let's go with peacekeeping. Let's have some humanitarian action. Use of force often produces bad results. Um, in the midst of these disagreements over strategy, civilians in Bosnia came to be much more threatened, and um, the Security Council decided, out of thin air, to create so-called safe areas, safe havens, for civilians in Bosnia in five or six uh, settings. Uh, which was done over the protests of the UN Secretariat, which argued there weren't enough troops to make anybody safe in these places. But the Council ignored the Secretariat, went right ahead, created safe areas, and one of them became sadly famous, Srebrenica, which, of course, was not safe at all. And so when the Serbs came, the Bosnian Serbs came, for the men and boys of Srebrenica, the UN was not able to put up much of a fight, partly because there were still disagreements amongst the countries of NATO and the countries of, UN, of the UN about strategy. And somewhere between six and 8,000 
men and boys from Srebrenica and surrounding villages lost their lives to a massacre. Both were very sobering events at the UN. And in response, a person, an American person, a woman, argued that this wasn't good enough. Being ashamed of oneself was a poor response to shameful inaction. That woman was Madeleine Albright, who had grown up during her childhood in part in Yugoslavia, had a strong attachment to the Balkans, also had a strong sense that just winking at genocide was not a good idea because it could be a precedent for more genocide somewhere else. And so the council created two international criminal tribunals to indict and eventually try those believed to be responsible for the worst crimes. And eventually, those two tribunals did. To their credit, they acquitted a number of the indictees, but they convicted others. Uh, and that created uh, the question, well, why only the Balkans and Rwanda? There are lots of crimes against humanity going on around the world, which created a call for an international criminal court, a more universal international criminal court. And that pressure was so strong that the statute of that court was agreed within three years, extraordinarily fast by treaty negotiation standards. And at first, countries were fairly hesitant to sign up, and a number of big ones still haven't signed up. And the second President Bush famously unsigned the, uh, the signature of President Clinton. But today, the court has a, a very significant majority of the UN member states having signed and ratified. So international criminal justice is a reality today. Uh, and uh, business is fairly brisk in The Hague uh, with indictees and several trials underway. We don't know what the result of any of this will be. Will it work? Will it deter anybody? Is it going to be too expensive relative to uh, the results? We simply don't know. What we do know is it's a major shift in international relations, because no head of state is safe anymore. Two of the indictees of the International Criminal Court uh, are or were heads of state. So heads of state are no longer as sovereign as they used to be. They are subject to international criminal law. Big change. Second change the rise of the influence of NGOs in the security sphere. NGOs had mattered in the human rights sphere and in the humanitarian action sphere, and also to a degree in the development sphere for a long time. But the Security Council had never met an NGO, never wanted to meet an NGO, because it was the province of states. And Rwanda changed that. And how did Rwanda change that? When France had nothing to say, the United States was being absent-minded. Um, Médecins Sans Frontières, the uh, medical uh, relief NGO, and some others had very good information on what was going on in Rwanda, all of which turned out to be accurate. And they channeled it through the president of the Security Council, a friend of both uh, Jim's and mine, Colin Keating. And uh, Keating then started reporting to the council what was happening. And that shamed the council membership into finally, but much too late, taking some pathetic measures towards the end of the conflict. And that established the credentials of some NGOs as having standing because the member states had disgraced themselves uh, and the NGOs had counteracted some of their damage. A third big uh, institutional factor is as the council became more active, uh, 
Member states woke up and thought, gee, the council is a more interesting place. Why are we not sitting in the council? Why is it this other country? Uh, and shouldn't there be more members of the council like us? Uh, so why don't we have some reform of the council, make it a bit more transparent, a bit more responsive to the rest of the membership, but also see if we could reform the veto, which we all dislike, and reform the composition so we could sit in it more often. And a number of member states thought, and by the way, we are now important enough that we could perhaps sit there as permanent members rather than as elected members. So this started a conversation in privately at first in the permanent mission of a country that's universally trusted diplomatically, uh, Singapore, that eventually moved to the UN and which has never concluded. So Security Council reform remains something that most countries say is important to them and is genuinely important to some of them, but it has been inconclusive so far. And we can come back to it later if, if you're interested. I promised you uh, a, a conclusion, and it comes back to sovereignty, which I mentioned earlier. In the old days, sovereignty was taken for granted in the Cold War years. It was infringed every now and then. A country would invade another country. But the principle of sovereignty was, went right on being the cornerstone of the international uh, relations system. But now the Security Council has, in effect, qualified sovereignty so often in perhaps 25 or 30 cases, that's an awful lot of cases, that we might say that the absolute sovereignty of states is increasingly a polite fiction of international relations rather than the cornerstone. And to sum up the attitude of countries in the world today, it might be, my sovereignty matters, yours doesn't. So our own sovereignty is tremendously important, but those of others is quite negotiable today. And that would be a very big shift in international relations, uh, up, uh, an upheaval of a system we've had with us since uh, the second half of the 17th century. Thank you very much. David, that was really interesting, and I think that there are a, a number of uh, assumptions people have that you really took aim at, so I'm especially grateful for that. And you began by saying that on 90% of the issues, actually the Security Council finds a way of acting, which I think is not at all the way most of us think. We just only hear about the Council when it's gridlocked. Um, and you ended in, in a somewhat similar place by saying, actually, this issue of sovereignty, which seems so neuralgic, has turned out to be more pushable than people mm -hmm. thought. Now, my impression is that uh, when the sovereignty of a country which has an important relationship with one of the P5 is threatened, suddenly sovereignty turns out still to be pretty fundamental. Uh, and the council is paralyzed in the way that we read about. Is that actually uh, oversaying it? I think it may be, because even going back a long way, in the early Cold War period, one of the nastiest conflicts that uh, was around then and is largely forgotten now, you may remember, had to do with the government of Cambodia. Was the government of Cambodia uh, a legitimate government or was it not? And how was peace to be brought to this country because there were two factions unalterably opposed to each other, prepared to fight to the death, prepared to fight to the last Cambodian life. Uh, and one of those factions was, in theory at least, unconditionally supported by Beijing. Uh, the Khmer Rouge. And by the way, to our shame, it also had been unconditionally supported by the Western powers for a long time because they disliked at the time 
the government installed by Vietnam in Phnom Penh even more than they liked, disliked the murderous Khmer Rouge. And that uh, situation came to a negotiated end and then elections for a government in Vietnam because China pressured its ally in uh, Cambodia to agree to a settled uh, or a negotiated settlement. So I think how great powers act towards their allies can vary. Sometimes they will back them up to the hilt, but sometimes not. The uh, Russian Federation, for example, during the Balkan Wars, sometimes supported Serbia quite loudly, and at other times was missing in action. Just as the Western powers blew hot and cold on the countries to which they were more sympathetic. So I also think the support of the great powers is unreliable, and smaller countries need to know that in case they are counting absolutely on the support of one or other of the great powers. Whatever is convenient to the great power will call the tune at any given time. But so one of the other books about our friend Kofi is titled Deliver Us From Evil. <clears throat> That's an ex in a way a shorthand for the moral hopes people have for the UN Security Council that in the face of uh, impending mass atrocities, the Security Council will act. And if you look at those cases, those are the ones where it always seems that someone's sovereignty winds up appearing inviolable, whether it's in the case of Sudan 10 years ago uh, or Syria today. Libya was a fascinating exception, and it now appears that that was quite literally the exception that proved the rule because the council members have now recoiled from their action there. So is that a case where the council still remains routinely unable to act? I don't think it was unable to act in Sudan. Uh, it acted at several levels. It often doesn't act alone. I mentioned regional organizations, and one of the strongest regional organizations politically today is the African Union. It's quite bolshy, and it's challenging the Security Council in terms of strategies to um, uh, resolve African conflicts. And uh, working together, the African Union and the UN forced on Sudan a peacekeeping operation in the Darfur area of Sudan in the mid-2000s. Um, a feckless uh, mission whose, membership, whose mission. membership was controlled by, by, uh, by President Bashir to a large extent. Up to a point, I'd say, but it was ineffective. Um, also, the International Criminal Tribunal, or court, indicted the president of Sudan so much for his sovereignty. Yeah. Um, no, he still moves around quite easily. He was here a few weeks ago. And a great deal of, but there are many places in the world where he doesn't move yeah. around. So his, uh, his freedom of action is at least circumscribed. Uh, uh, secondly, um, Sudan came under great pressure, partly because of the problems in Darfur, once and for all to settle uh, the problem of, its, of the relations of the central government with the southern Sudanese region. Uh, and arguably, uh, South Sudan would not have emerged without a great deal of international pressure on Sudan. Uh, now, whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, South Sudan today is experiencing quite a lot of difficulty governing itself. Uh, could be argued. But I'd say the sovereignty of Sudan, at least, was uh, uh, fairly qualified uh, by then. Um, but it is true that in some cases, uh, the sovereignty of a country will be respected for a number of reasons. So what about Russia? So this, one has the impression that the Russians are now almost perverse by, uh, by as, as an act of intention, 
Uh, do you see Russia as, be, as being and remaining uh, a, a kind of structural obstacle to useful action in the council? Um, I find predicting in the field of international relations very difficult mm -hmm. and because I'm usually wrong when I predict. Uh, so what I will say is that no country, and that includes Russia, enjoys being condemned by many other countries for its activities. And when after the referendum in Crimea, which uh, voted and probably accurately, overwhelmingly to join the Russian Federation, uh, there were two votes at the United Nations. Both votes came out very heavily against the Russian Federation. Um, uh, particularly in the Security Council, where the surprise in the vote wasn't that Russia vetoed the resolution condemning itself. It was that China failed to join it in vetoing that resolution. Why? Because China takes sovereignty quite seriously. And so infringement of sovereignty is of that nature is worrying to China. Secondly, it may have been a message from Beijing to Moscow as to who is top dog now. <laughs> so that's interesting. So th th that dynamic, which used to be that China was prepared to take Russia's side almost automatically, you're saying that vote may be an important straw in the wind that that moment is, is over. Or Perhaps. Yeah. One can only yeah. speculate. That's very interesting. So let me ask you about terrorism, because you mentioned that as, as one thing that actually unifies all the members. Um, the UN has a committee which tracks terror financing and things like that. But what are the examples of important council action on terrorism, which might kind of point towards where the council is going to be going on this issue? Well, I think like uh, most uh, human beings who get excessively excited, decision making becomes a bit irrational amongst member states who are overexcited. And after 9-11, it wasn't just the US that was very excited. It was many member states, because when one member state is spectacularly and successfully targeted, that's worrying in all sorts of places. So there was a, a view at the UN, not just in Washington, that now more uh, meaningful decisions needed to be taken on against uh, terrorists and suspected terrorists. And this head of steam went on producing council decisions, including the listing of a number of individuals who were suspected of affiliation with terrorist groups. And these individuals lived all over the world. And um, so the council really seemed to be making law at the international level. Uh, and Happily, I think, for the UN and for the Security Council, several of those targeted were residents of the European Union. And they went to court. And they said, well, listen, there's no due process. How do I appeal this? Even if I can demonstrate that I have no affiliation with a terrorist organization, uh, there's no appeal of any Security Council decision possible. So I am appealing to European courts to decide that at least in Europe, with no due process, uh, these decisions should not be implemented. Seemed rather fanciful at first, and courts, as they often do, contradicted each other over a long and winding uh, series of appeals and cases. But Eventually, uh, the European court system, the European Union court system, came down very firmly on the side of due process. And it said that even though by then the council was backpedaling very strongly and had introduced due process appeal processes, an ombudsperson had started removing names frantically from the list of whom they had no proof whatsoever uh, against, um, by then, the damage was done, and the highest European court said, listen, 
none of this satisfies us that the Council is serious about due process. So within the European Union, these decisions simply will not be implemented. A great embarrassment for the government of Britain, by the way, because Britain had felt as a permanent member, as a member of the Security Council, it should defend the decisions of the Security Council. And to have the European Court find decisively against its position in this case, barely reported, by the way, in the British press, interestingly, was in diplomatic terms a major embarrassment. Well, so I guess Security Council overzealous is mm. not, that's not the usual no. stereotype. Uh, but I, I still want to go back to my question, mm. which is when you think about states that are prosecuting their version of the war on terror, yes. whether it's the United States or Russia or in this part of the world as well, uh, the one example that comes to mind is Egypt just recently asked the Security Council to basically authorize uh, arming the Libyan government in order to fight terrorists, which the council then swatted away. Yes. Uh, so my sense is that this is not an issue where the big questions have very much come before the council, the question of, of counterterrorism. Well, I think the question of counterterrorism will always come uh, to the council with greater force if it is brought by one of the members of the council, particularly a permanent member. Uh, so if you're a country that claims to be a victim of uh, terrorism rather than, say, an act of war or, say, common crime on a large scale, uh, it's going to be more difficult to make your core, uh, case than if you're one of the club. If you're one of the club, the club is usually quite sympathetic. Well, I wonder, though, I mean, if you think about... Um the sort of, you know, of George Bush going to the council in Iraq as a mm. kind of paradigm. Uh, this is a case where we're talking about matters that states define as their own supreme national security. Mm. Therefore, if they're able to act independently, they're not going to permit themselves to be deflected by the council. They may seek the legitimacy of having the council ratify their act, but mm. if the council doesn't ratify their act, they're going to go ahead and do it anyway. Absolutely, because states that are attacked directly, by and large, can resort to self-defense. Self-defense doesn't require an authorization by the Security Council. It's the one argument that if you can make it credibly, and Egypt can make a credible case of self-defense, it seems to me, against the executioners of uh, a number of its apparently completely innocent civilians, uh, it can deal with them itself. But it was looking for international endorsement, and often states like to look for international mm -hmm. endorsement when they are clearly uh, in, uh, overriding the sovereignty of a neighbor or uh, going to war, quite yeah. simply. So let me ask you a little bit about this question of Security Council reform and expansion, because it's a great bugbear in the UN world, because it's an example of something which everybody says must happen, and then it never happens. So let's take the two different things you mentioned, the idea of doing something or other about the veto, and then the question of membership. So uh, a cross-section of, of member states has said that at the very least, the veto should no longer be used in the case, in certain, in, uh, basically in the case of, of, of mass atrocities. Yes. It seems like that's absolutely the right thing. It also seems unimaginable that that would happen. Is that, am I being too cynical? Uh, I think uh, uh, the permanent members rarely apply the veto uh, in cases of mass atrocities. They only do if they have a national interest at stake. So uh, that, in a way, was, it was a, a, a good proposal, but is unlikely to be accepted by the permanent members in case they happen to have a stake in That's one of these situations precisely what I think they in would the say, future. Right. Yeah. So uh, there, but other reforms have been proposed that might stand a better chance. Britain and France, which are a bit more nervous than they used to be about losing their permanent seats altogether, have made some very creative suggestions on 
the veto and also on the working methods of the council. And one of their suggestions is that in situations calling for the use of force or the stronger measures that the council uh, sometimes adopts, perhaps you'd need two vetoes rather than one huh. for it to be effective. So a number of ideas have been kicked around, and Britain and France have been creative and helpful on this, but none of uh, Beijing, Moscow, mm -hmm. or Washington seem frantically interested in joining that conversation. And the U.S. is just as sovereigntist mm -hmm. as, as either Russia or China is when it comes to matters like this. At least. At least, right. So now, membership. So, so I have a couple questions. One is, it is always said that there's a crisis of legitimacy because the UN's permanent five are legacy members from the end of World War II, and, and this is increasingly damaging the legitimacy of Security Council decisions. First of all, is that so? Um, I think it will be so in the future. It's becoming so, I'd say because the claim of a number of countries to be meaningful powers in the world today is much stronger than it would have been 15 years ago. I'm thinking of countries like India, like Brazil, like South Africa, which is a major regional power in Africa. Um, and behind them are some others uh, who uh, are rapidly developing into meaningful, at least regional, uh, powers, countries like Indonesia, uh, which have weight in international relations. And by the way, we were discussing all of this in a class of uh, Professor Scharf this morning, so, um, which was fun for me. Um, so these countries have a legitimate claim because they are genuinely meaningful should they not be in the council more systematically, if not permanently, with a veto. By the way, the member states have made clear, uh, particularly the small member states, that they detest the veto. They detest the use of the veto by the existing permanent members, and they simply will never grant a veto again. And this confronts the candidates for uh, permanent seats now, say India and Brazil, with a dilemma. Do they still want to be permanent members but without a veto, which makes them second-class permanent members? Certainly India has or, said, we don't want that. Right? Well, India, I think, doesn't want that. Uh, or do they prefer to be outside the tent complaining about the iniquitous uh, order in the Security Council? Now, what the Indians have said is they could accept the permanent seat without a veto as long as the conversation on the veto wasn't closed and could be raised again 10 years in the future. There are two other countries that make a strong claim to a permanent membership status, and those countries are Japan and Germany, but their claim was initially of a different order. And in the case of Japan, it's still of that order. And that claim was based on the fact that they were paying a very large share of the UN's bill. When Japan presented its candidacy, Japan was paying nearly 20% of the UN bill. That's a relevant fact. Uh, today, it's no longer paying so big a share of the bill, but it still has a meaningful share hovering around 10%. There, there was a brief moment when Japan might have wound up paying more than the United States if the U.S. Senate had gotten their way in reducing American dues. Indeed. They could have become the biggest dues payer in the U.S. Indeed. By the way, some of us worried the U.S. Senate by arguing the U.S. should actually go down to 10% when it would cease worrying the rest <laughs> of us because its blackmail it would, would stop right. being effective. So that wasn't so popular in the Senate as an argument. So, oh, I'm sorry, But uh, coming to Germany, it's in a different position. Why? Um, Japan is in a neighborhood of rising powers. And Japan is the third economy of the world. It's a really meaningful country. But it has hardly been rising relative to others for the last 20 years. And its share of the UN bill demonstrates that. Germany's in a completely different situation because without doing or saying anything much, uh, 
Germany has become overwhelmingly the most powerful country in Western Europe and probably in Europe as a whole. Uh, and there, the dilemma for Angela Merkel, who already is spending more time on international relations than she'd like to, is why she would need a permanent seat. She's already the most powerful person in Europe. So what's this permanent seat nonsense my foreign ministry keeps inconveniencing me with? Um, Putin takes my calls, Obama <laughs> takes my calls. What's wrong with the current situation? So she, again, is in a completely different situation. And so the four countries that banded together and still formally band together in the quest for a permanent seat are, in fact, very different countries with very different claims within the international system. Well, so just one last question, then I want to turn it over to the audience. So since those four countries took a run at permanent membership in 2005 and basically caused what I think even Kofi Annan called a, a train wreck, um, and this has been going on now for, I don't know, 18 or 20 years, um, is there any reason to think that this is soluble and, in fact, the Security Council will expand to include either veto-bearing or non-veto-bearing permanent members? Well, uh, in fairness to the four countries, Kofi encouraged them to uh, press their claim. He also which encouraged, he encouraged the, their rivals at the same well. time. So that's true. Yeah. So he's partly responsible for the train wreck. Uh, and I say this as a huge fan of Kofi Annan. But it's amazing how revisionist people are about their own history as time goes on. Um, uh, on... Um, uh, the basic question. It's a paradox, and there are many paradoxes in international relations. Security Council reform is secretly opposed by all of the permanent members. They claim to be in favor of it. Britain and France may actually be somewhat in favor of it, because if it waits too long, they'll lose their seats for sure, uh, in favor of either the European Union or Germany. But um, uh, the permanent members are comfortable as they are, and basically they'd like to stave off change for as long as possible. But even they realize that if they wait too long, the action will move somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And in the Kosovo crisis, some of you may remember that in early 1999, the Western powers wanted to act militarily to protect civilians in Kosovo through air power, and the Russians threatened a veto. And the Western powers worried, actually, not liking having to do this, decided to act. And they just decided to act as a humanitarian exception to international law. This rather shocked the Russians, and what shocked them more was they made the mistake three days later of presenting a resolution in the, the Security Council condemning NATO, which went down in flames. They were only able to get three votes, which um, meant that 12 countries in the Council disagreed with them on that. It didn't legitimize what NATO was doing, but it seemed to suggest a degree of member state support for what NATO was doing. So that induced a sense in the Russian Federation of, gee, that wasn't too hot. Uh, perhaps we'd better settle this dispute in a hurry. But having threatened a veto, doing it in the Security Council wasn't very feasible because you don't want to embarrass yourself by unthreatening <laughs> to veto. So the conversation moved to a completely different forum the group of seven or eight forum by then, of which conveniently the Russian Federation was a member. Most of the major Western powers were members. And there is no veto in the group of eight. Within weeks, they'd agreed on an outcome they all thought was a great outcome. They brought it to the Security Council and said, Security Council, please endorse this. Chinese and everybody else thought it was a very good idea to endorse this strategy that had been devised elsewhere. 
Well, that sort of thing is going to start happening a whole lot more unless the Security Council is uh, reformed, and that will weaken the Council's authority, and it will also weaken the UN's centrality in international relations. So that's a big risk yeah. for the permanent members because part of their international stature depends on the Security Council being an important body. Right. Good evening, thank you very much. It was very thought-provoking and interesting. Um, I'm actually concerned about the International Criminal Court, and as a next step, I'm wondering whether they should do a better job of recognizing the political significance and the political depth of their rulings and of their decisions, especially when it comes to the countries who the people who are being prosecuted there at the moment come from. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, your question is a complex one because it uh, calls for an answer at several levels. It's a wonderful question because, uh, uh, as I know you know, uh, the docket of the International Criminal Court for the moment is entirely African. Uh, all of the indictees are African. And this has created a crisis of credibility for the court in Africa, which is all the more regrettable because the strongest support for the creation of the court came from Africa. So you could, uh, for example, speculate that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court wasn't politically very astute. Perhaps he should have looked for some cases beyond Africa, and perhaps that's true. But uh, in uh, justice, justice is meant to be blind to political considerations. So at a very abstract level, you can argue that, well, the prosecutor was right to indict where the worst crimes were being committed and where it was possible to identify individuals who very likely were involved in the crimes. As a matter of political expediency, I think it's fair to say that uh, a number of people in the court are now busily looking for cases elsewhere. Uh, what those cases will be, I don't know. Uh, uh, whether they will be successful cases, I don't know. Whether they will be politically correct cases, I don't know. But I think your basic premise was right, that the court created a major political credibility problem for itself in Africa, and that was very, very unfortunate, and it was probably preventable. And it argues to a lack of political skills amongst some of the staff. Oh, thank you for an amazing speech. And my question is about the this 10% of unresolved uh, conflicts. Uh, well, of course, 90% is a huge number, but I clearly doubt that Security Council is interested in statistics. And uh, the last, this 10% of unresolved conflicts that include, include Syria and Ukraine are the hottest in the recent memory. Uh, and um, considering that they're not resolved yet, doesn't it still uh, undermine the credibility a bit about all the Security Council? despite the 90% approval rating? Thank you. Uh, well, very good question. Uh, first of all, Libya, I think, is, uh, which you didn't mention, is a country in terrible turmoil today. It's a country that NATO sought permission from the Security Council to uh, launch an operation within. The aims of that operation were humanitarian to protect the threatened population of Benghazi. But then, in my opinion, which is just a personal opinion, NATO way overstepped the mandate it had been granted to protect civilians to affect regime change, which hadn't been part of the mandate. And that precipitated um, all sorts of upheavals within the country that nobody wants to deal with internationally. And so, um, and the NATO countries, by the way, have just walked away from this mess that they weren't alone in creating, 
but which they contributed to create. They don't seem to feel any responsibility for what's going on in Libya today, which bothers me as a citizen of a NATO country. Um, Syria and Ukraine are both very kinetic cases, but they're very different from each other. Syria is a terrible case because it has produced so many refugees. It has produced so many casualties, mainly civilian casualties, inside the country, occasionally outside the country. It also has produced a huge humanitarian burden on Turkey, on Jordan, and I won't say how much I admire those two countries for hosting largely uncomplainingly and not sufficiently assisted uh, the vast number of refugees who have found their way into those two uh, countries. I used to live in Jordan. Turkey is a country I also like very much. I feel very strongly about what they are doing, unheralded largely, uh, to help individuals who are victims of uh, the crisis. So it is a major humanitarian crisis, and it's a mutating crisis as well. It's difficult to follow day to day for people like me, even though I used to live in Syria also, uh, and I'm very attached to Syria. It's so complex that I have trouble following it uh, closely. So it's a major crisis that's going to have major lasting consequences in the Middle East, possibly for borders in the Middle East in the future. Uh, it seems to me unlikely that Syria will return to its pre-existing borders, and that will be uh, a major change in the Middle East. Um, Ukraine is somewhat different. There have been many casualties, but on a much smaller scale than Syria. So I distinguish in terms of humanitarian, uh, the extent of the humanitarian disaster uh, in the two. They're also different in that one protagonist in Ukraine is a permanent member. None of the protagonists in Syria are permanent members. And while we may think that the Russians are deeply engaged in support of the government of Syria, I'm not so sure that's all that true anymore, partly uh, for the reason I cited earlier, and partly also that when chemical weapons showed up in Syria, uh, the Russians and the Americans spoke to each other within a matter of minutes and agreed without any reference to the government of Syria that their number one priority was now to remove those weapons from uh, Syria. So where the Russian Federation actually is on Syria today, I don't know. A number of very strong statements in support of the government in Damascus have been made in Moscow, but some of their actions seem to belie the strength of those declarations. Um, uh, but there's no doubt that in the Ukraine, uh, the Russian Federation, which is one of the three dominant permanent members in the Security Council, has a very strong stake uh, in the crisis. And that makes it a more difficult crisis for the Council to deal with. Indeed, the Council has only voted on the Ukraine once, in the case I mentioned uh, after the Crimea uh, referendum and incorporation into the Russian Federation. So very difficult when a permanent member is directly involved in a crisis uh, to deal with it. So you're right, they are big crises, they're telegenic uh, crises, uh, and they're geostrategically significant crises. They're not like a minor conflict in a small country in a distant continent of which we know little. Both are significant uh, international crises, but they're quite different from each other, and I think the permanent members approach them rather differently, and that was, in a way, the point of my answer to a, a very interesting question for which I thank you. Um, what you said about refugees, about the refugee issue 
uh, regarding an influx of people, of displaced persons into Jordan and Turkey really um, got to me because the figures are startling. Um, regarding such humanitarian crises that tend to displace uh, persons across borders, have you noticed in your time any correlation between individual members, individual Security Council members, governmental structure, and their willingness to use military intervention in response to humanitarian crises? Uh, I think the Western powers are more inclined uh, to use military instruments uh, in these international conflicts than either China or the Russian Federation. China, the history of China's membership in the Security Council, and it's important to remember that uh, the People's Republic of China displaced the Republic of China, uh, in other words, Taiwan, in 1971. And in 1971, uh, China was still in the late throes of the Cultural Revolution. Um, it was in a very weak position to engage in an activist diplomacy. So China, for the first 20 years that it sat in the council, was extremely prudent, mostly silent, actually learning a great deal, because the Chinese are great learners, as uh, we've all observed in terms of China's development track. Uh, and it's only recently that China has developed a mature diplomacy, and it's a very pragmatic diplomacy. So by and large, China opposes the use of force in principle. Doesn't mean it won't agree to it, because it has agreed to it in Africa a number of times. It did uh, abstain on uh, NATO's use of force in Libya. It could have blocked it. Uh, so, uh, essentially, rather uh, pragmatic. And in the case of the Russian Federation, it is, like China, more prudent on the idea that the use of force can help solve international problems. Doesn't mean it doesn't use force itself, as we see, but uh, generally fairly prudent in that regard. So pressure to use force uh, in the Security Council generally comes from the Western powers, usually for humanitarian reasons. But when Russia uses force, it does like to cover itself in the cloak of the responsibility to protect. It has cited Indeed. that both in the case of Georgia and even in the case of Ukraine, the principle that one has a responsibility to protect speakers of one's language located abroad, a, a, a concept not yet recognized in international law. Mm. Indeed. Uh, it, all countries like to invoke uh, legal and humanitarian principles to justify whatever they're doing, including looting banks, money laundering, and all the rest of it. Uh, that's the nature of international relations. And then the rest of the world decides how credible these uh, arguments are. A number of the American arguments during the Vietnam War didn't hold up very well internationally either, it should be said. And the United States wound up being thoroughly isolated by the end of and the war. It wasn't about to so, let the Security Council get anywhere near the Vietnam indeed. War. Indeed. So all countries, as I say, engage in those types of arguments. Thank you very much for being with us today. I wanted to ask you about um, how does the UN feel about the recent um, xenophobic attitudes that have arisen, especially in uh, Europe, and that may be related with migration flows uh, in areas of conflict such as the Middle East, and that has been uh, exploited by uh, right-wing political parties that have grown stronger in the recent years in Europe. Well, thank you for that. Uh, actually, uh, my institution, the UN University, uh, sponsored a conference at UNESCO uh, late last week on this very issue. And one thing that came out very strongly at the conference, which is always a surprise to worried people in the, the global north, is that the major migration flows of recent history have all been within the south. 
And the largest migration flow at the moment is a huge flow within China resulting from rapid urbanization. And India is not far behind on rapid urbanization. So these are the vast migration flows of our era. And when I was a, a, a young guy, like six centuries ago, uh, my first job took me to Sudan. And when I got to Sudan, I got to know Khartoum, which is a lovely town with the two Niles coming together. And eventually I explored the suburbs of Khartoum. And what was going on in the suburbs of Khartoum? There was a huge belt of human habitation around Khartoum. And all of this belt were migrants from Chad at the time and fighting in Chad. And far from being victimized, somehow they were able to survive without much UN help, but with help from Sudanese. Then I flew to South Sudan, which was having a, a lull in the rather active civil war between North and South. And what was going on in Juba, the capital? Well, there was an epidemic of bubonic plague. But the big news was hundreds of thousands of Ugandan refugees camped just outside town because Idi Amin was in power in Uganda, victimizing everybody in his own country. So a lot of people had fled to neighboring countries, including South Sudan. And what was happening there? There was nothing to eat in Juba for anybody. They had run out of food, largely. What little food there was was being shared with the refugees. And who was overseeing this? All of the religious leaders of various religions in Juba were overseeing the sharing of food with these refugees. The UN had nothing to do with it. So when in the West we're inclined to think we're being victimized by migrants, we might think a little bit more about the more generous impulses in the developing parts of the world towards people uh, needing to seek refuge, often for reasons totally beyond their own control. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, I think um, Europe is being caught at a moment of great economic insecurity within the European Union uh, region that uh, provides one set of opportunities to politicians of all stripes, but the fear at a time of job shortages that foreigners are going to come and steal the few jobs there are is an absolute godsend to certain types of politicians. Uh, and they would have been the extreme left 30 years ago or 40 years ago. They happen to be the extreme right now. Um, but uh, the fear uh, at a time of economic crisis is, uh, has to be understood before you can come up with strategies to explain to your population that actually the relatively modest, although growing, number of migrants from mainly Libya or through Libya to Europe is not going to overwhelm Europe anytime soon. Uh, but this argument isn't yet being made, uh, and the EU's response has been largely one, unfortunately, of believing that their previously rather successful rescue operation for uh, uh, people uh, in distress in boats was being too effective and encouraging more people to come. Now the remaining effort is too small to be fully effective, and many people are losing uh, their lives. On that, I'd like to say that uh, my heart goes out to Italy, which has responded much, much more positively than the rest of Europe has to this crisis. It has responded in a way that, um, how can I say, gives expression to the humanity of Italians. And I hope that may spread northward uh, as the crisis does not abate. <laughs>
Well, David, thank you for the last of a string of sharp and counterintuitive observations. So thank you so much. Thank you.